Let the church say amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, all nations. Sabbath. I suspect somebody will need this. I want to thank your pastor, Dr. Brooks, for the invitation to come over here today and to share these moments with you. I consider it a blessing, and it was a joy for my crew <laughs> to come over with me. Over there, we have Sister Latoya, we have Sister Shernet, and we have Sister Lesit, Sister Leslie. <laughs> All right, so we are all here to enjoy sweet fellowship at all nations. And I understand that you are also enjoying this facility for a short while, but you're enjoying it. And the music today also tells that you are enjoying worshiping here at all nations. I want to commend our music team for lifting the spirits and making us feel the sunshine inside. Yes. Regardless of what's happening outside, we are happy inside with Jesus. Yes. And so today, we give God thanks for another Sabbath. It's been a rough week for many, but we always can look forward to a Sabbath when we come together and fellowship in the house of the Lord. And today is no less. And so we wish you will enjoy sweet fellowship with Jesus as we explore the topic, there's enough water for the thirsty. Amen. Heavenly Father, we invite you to come and make yourself plain to us today. As we explore your words, in Jesus' name. Water. What we, would we do without it? Water plays a vital role in maintaining the overall health of the human body and is indispensable. It's an indispensable necessity for survival on this planet or any other. It is impossible for us to survive for long without water. And God knew that. So he provided an abundant supply to satisfy all our needs. Although last Sabbath I was at a certain church and I met a brother who said he doesn't drink water. Well, I said, you must have gotten some kind of uh, water somehow. But he probably said, doesn't like water. So I don't know how he made it. But lubrication and all of that must have come from drinking something else. <laughs> and it's hope, I hope it's not what I'm thinking. <laughs> the human body is two-thirds water. And 70% of the earth's surface is made up of water. By the time you are 70 years old, all the 70-year-old, raise your hands. By the way, I'm raising mine. <laughs> By that time, you would have come consumed one and a half million gallons of water just to survive. Studies show that increasing water consumption can decrease fat deposits in the body. Water is a natural appetite suppressant if you drink enough of it. The body absorbs cold water faster than it absorbs hot water. Did you know that? And for optimal function, our body needs water inside 
as well as outside. ABC Science Online says that thirst makes you feel more pain. Did you know that? This Australian expert, Dr. Farrell, claims that going without a drink of water can make you more sensitive to pain. If you lose 2% of your body's water supply, your energy will decrease 20%. A 10% decrease in water, you will be unable to walk. And a 20% decrease in water, you're dead. Water is vital. When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he apparently had not made adequate supply. He had an inadequate supply of food and water. Well, I would pardon Moses because the journey was only supposed to take 40 days. So, you know, you could, anybody could pack enough water for a month. Especially if you had so many cattle and horses and donkeys and whatever in your pack, you can carry what you need. Am I right? So, uh, after a while, as you discover, as you know, because of disobedience and doubt and lack of trust in God, what should have taken 40 days took what? 40 years. And so by the time we come to Exodus chapter 16, you know, Exodus had to do with the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt to Canaan. So by the time we got to Exodus chapter 16, there was a big problem. Food ran out. And so you ought to read what happens there. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 1, it says, And they took their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin. What a name. Which is between Elim and Sinai. And on the 15th day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Actually, uh, it was a desert. Uh, wilderness, you would expect trees, and trees need water to grow. But that was how it was rendered then, but it was a desert. And the children of Israel said to him, Would to God we had died in the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots. They remember all that curry goat. <laughs> and when we did eat bread. To the full. For ye have brought us up forth in this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. That's serious. And that's rough on any leader. Because to have thousands of people and their animals with you and have no and run out of food. You know, Pastor told you that one of my jobs in the church was to be youth director and there's one thing I always make sure that my young people don't run out of food 
Do you know how it is when you run out of food at home? And then for me to have hundreds of young people at camp and have them run out of food, that's trouble. <laughs> trouble. So I sympathize greatly with Moses. And I guess you can too. And so it was right there, if you read the rest of the story, God had to go to, Moses had to go to God and say, Lord, I'm in trouble. What can you do for me with these people? And God said, okay, don't worry. Just tell them tomorrow morning, go out with their baskets and gather what they find. But make sure they only gather for. But when they get to the sixth day, make sure they gather for two days. And so the people went out and they went out with their baskets and they found something they didn't know what it was. They didn't know what to call it. They call it manna. Bread from heaven. And so they were satisfied. But by the time you got to chapter 17, they were now moving from this wilderness of sin and they were moving to another place. So let's look at chapter 17. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeyings according to the commandment of the Lord. And they pitched their camps at Rephidim. And there was no water there for the people to drink. So problem number two. One time he ran out of food and they were satisfied and uh, no more complaints. But then they moved now from wilderness of sin to this place called Rephidim. And then problem number two surfaced for there was no water. Wherefore the people did chide Moses. And said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why chide with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle in this, with this thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost now ready to stone me. So, the Israelites... Or Moses recognized that he was in serious trouble because he had these millions of people with their animals and there was no water to quench the thirst of the people nor the animals. So that was a bigger problem. And so the people got progressively worse in their behavior, in their thinking, that they were now ready to do what? To stone Moses. And so Moses had to do what he did before and cry out to his friend and cry out to the Lord, what shall I do? The Israelites parched from their journey and finding no water blamed Moses for taking them out of Egypt. For here, 
they were about to stone him. And so Moses had to remind them that getting them out of Egypt was really not his idea. Well, I guess that was one way of trying to save his skin as well. But it was Jehovah's idea. And what they were doing with their complaining was that they were putting Jehovah to the test. And that is they were challenging the Lord and trying his patience rather than trusting in him. And so their violent intentions and impatient desire compounded by their thirst made them outrageous. So they challenged Moses. They challenged Moses to give them water because recently he had miraculously supplied them with bread. Though they complained about the quality. All this veggie bread. <laughs> Too thin. They were accustomed to. It's an interesting story. Read it. They challenged Moses to take them back to Egypt. If he could not take care of them. Because they did not wish to die of thirst. At least in Egypt, they would get a decent Dignified funeral. <laughs> Even though they were slaves, they were assured of that. And so they were ready to stone poor Moses. They challenged Moses to prove that this God that he came to tell them about was still leading them and not having abandoned them. On this dead end street. So they questioned God's presence. Whether God was really with them. They questioned God's providence. Whether he was still able to provide for them. And they questioned God's promise. That he was going to lead them. To a place of abundance. That was ancient Israel. We pride ourselves of being called modern Israel. How much are we like them? How much do we differ from them? I doubt very much. Because when we run into difficulties, when we run into challenges and we can't see our way out, we do the same thing. We question God's presence. We wonder if he is still with us. We wonder if he still sees us. We wonder if he could still provide for us. Because I have so much need. That is not being attended. And we wonder. If he is still able to take us. To the place he has promised. Moses did what we are all encouraged to do. When our proverbial back are against the wall. He made his complaint to God. Moses begs God for direction in telling him what to do. For although he was helpless, thank God he was not hopeless. You must first know God personally. In order to understand when God answers you. It is because Moses had a relationship with God. 
that he was able to take even some very strange instructions. Because when he ran into trouble, what God told him really didn't really sound like it made much sense. Because God told him that he should take some elders and that he should take a rod. Now, when you need to catch water, you don't take a rod. You go and find a what? A bucket. And so normally and naturally, you would have expected that God would say, tell the people to bring all the buckets they could find. And go down to the river. But there was no river, God says, to a rock. Now, whoever heard water coming out of a rock? But God's instructions sometimes are really strange. But if we take the time to listen and understand God's promises, we would be more faithful in what we do. Because in that instruction, God told Moses, I am going to stand on the rock. In other words, you're not going to go there by yourself. You take the rod. When you go to the rock, you give it a good strike. And you will see the miracle that you need. And so Moses obeyed God and immediately when he struck the rock, Though he did not see God on the rock. God just told him that I would be there on the rock. He didn't see God, but he followed God's instructions. He struck the rock and immediately an abundance of water just ran out of the rock and ran through the camp in many streams. And what some of you didn't catch, that ancient Jews, Jewish scholars, and Bible commentators verified that there were many streams that came out of that rock. And that all, in all their journeyings, up the mountains, down the valleys, on the plains, and wherever they encamp, the water followed them. Water followed them and formed cisterns and pools by their camps that they were never ever able to run out of water any time after that. Because God was true to his word. God was true to his promise. And so although we may run into difficulties at times. We may run into challenges and places and situations that we cannot see through. Just hold fast because our God is going to come through. He's going to come true. God never fails. And so this is what we need to understand. That God will supply all our needs. We do not have a God that is short on supplies. You can't need more than God can supply. 
This miracle that was performed was to be an immortal lesson to Moses, the families of Israel, and for people of all generations to our time and beyond. It was intended to teach us about the all-sufficiency of the God that we serve of Jesus, the eternal rock of ages. And so Paul clarified this in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. Here's what Paul said of there, over there. The rock that followed them on this journey was not an ordinary rock. And here's what he said. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. The operative word here is that it followed them. Just like I told you, wherever they went during their journeys, they had water. Because this was the water that Jesus supplied. And so, in your spiritual journey, in your spiritual journey, are you thirsty? You know, there's a song that I'm sure you all know and you sing. I will sing of the goodness of the Lord, for his goodness keeps what? Running after me. You don't have to run after Jesus. He does the pursuing. He came and he gave his life. Even before you were born, before you knew yourself. He prepared the way for you so that you can enjoy freedom from sin and salvation in Jesus Christ. We can all be assured that when we are experiencing our worst crisis in the family or in this life, Christ our rock will always answer when we call. He will help us when we fall and when you fall he stands ready to satisfy the deepest longings of your soul and quench every thirst thirsty need that you have in your soul for his goodness keeps running after you there's no need that my god cannot handle there's no problem so difficult that he cannot solve. For Paul says in Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your needs. He didn't say all your wants. Because we want a lot of things and many of the things we want are not good for us. And many of the things we want, we can't manage it. But it says, my God will supply all you need to keep you. To keep you on the journey. According to his riches. Praise God I don't serve a poor God. I serve a God who is a God of abundance. <laughs> and so according to his riches in glory. By Jesus Christ. And so whether that be a need for water. Whether that be a need for shelter. Whether that be a need for food, whether that be a need for job, whether that be a need for personal healing, 
whether that be a need for a change of heart or a change of life, my God can supply all that I need according to his riches in glory. To the woman at the well, Jesus offered himself as the solution to her problem. She came for water at a time she did not expect to find anyone at the well because of her lifestyle. But she left that fountain of living waters with a spring in her steps and a spring in her soul. An unquenchable spring. That after she left the presence of Jesus, it caused her to go out into the entire village and say, listen, you men, you think you were good? Come, see a man. <laughs> see a man that told me everything that ever I did but more than that he has left within me a spring of living waters come see a man the man Christ Jesus this man is still the problem solver and can be the solution to your problem or any problem today time has not reduced the effectiveness of the salvific potency of the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus is a perfect antidote for the problem of sin. The blood that Jesus shed, says the songwriter, shall never, ever lose its power. Jesus is God's provision for man's thirst. Are you thirsty? In one of the commentaries it says that the soul by nature is like a desert. Or like a traveler wandering through such a desert. He is thirsting for happiness. And seeking it everywhere and finds it not. He looks in all directions and tries all objects. But in vain. Nothing meets its desires. Though a sinner seeks for joy in wealth and pleasures. Yet he is not satisfied. He still thirsts for more and seeks still for happiness in some new enjoyment. To such a weary and unsatisfied sinner, the grace of Christ is as cold water to a thirsty soul. An oasis in the desert, says Barnes' commentary. And if in your life, You've been running into drought. Try Jesus. You might have had that experience, but today Christ offers water for your thirsty soul. And you can be changed today. You did not come here by chance. God woke you up this morning and guided your steps here. Because he's interested in saving you and your family. To the woman at the well, Jesus promised to give her an eternal spring. He says, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give shall never thirst again. It shall be in him a spring of water welling up into everlasting life. You may be experiencing a drought in your soul. But today you can come to the fountain of life. 
and draw water constantly from his well. Are you thirsty? If you are experienced thirst, experiencing thirst, then you are still in Rephidim. Rephidim was where water ran out. You remember that? But today, Jesus offers Calvary, where a fountain freely flows for your cleansing. Rephidim, a symbol of hardship. Rephidim, a symbol of difficulties. Rephidim, a symbol of war. Rephidim, a symbol of barrenness. But you know, years later, it was at Rephidim that God gave Israel victory over the Amalekites. In your thirst, God can give you victory right there in your Rephidim. Yes, and he can give you victory over all your besetting sins. God wants to take you from the wilderness of sin to the freedom of Calvary. Rephidim was a name the Israelites would not wish to remember with any fondness, but it was here that they found the rock. That rock that quenched their thirst. And that rock that followed them everywhere. A rock speaks to security. A rock speaks to shelter. A rock speaks to a place of safety, durability, and strength. And you can find this all in Jesus. Jesus is God's rock who was fatally smitten on Calvary by those he came to save. From this smiting, however, an eternal gushing stream continues to flow for our cleansing and for our healing. Jesus reassured the woman that whosoever drinks of the natural water, you are going to thirst again. That water was spiritually ineffective. And many of us have been drinking at ineffective streams. That natural water, which is spiritually ineffective, cannot be applied neither inside nor outside. For spiritual cleansing. It doesn't work. But the water that Jesus gives. Is the most effective on the inside. The natural water needs a cistern. Or a container to receive it. From an external source. But that which Jesus gives. Is a fountain that gushes from the inside. You cannot be with Jesus and nobody knows it because it is going to affect them. They are going to need some of the water that you have. And so wherever you go, you need to reflect your relationship with Jesus so that they can ask you what's happening in your life. I need to be like you. Each stream having its confluence in the great ocean of God's love. The world cannot supply the needs of the soul, but Jesus can. Separated from the cross of Christ, our life is barren and empty. Isaiah reaffirms that the solution for your soul is found in Isaiah 53, 5. But he was what? Wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him, but with his stripes, praise God, we are healed. Yes, we should have been on that cross, not him. But he went there for us. Jesus suffered all five kinds of wounds known to medical science. All right. I have a nurse or a doctor in the house. <laughs> Confusion, contu, confu, contusions, which is blows by a rod. Somebody hit you with a rod, you suffer from contusions. Lacerations, scourging. He suffered that for us. Penetrating wounds, the crown of thorns, he suffered that for us. Perforating wounds, the nails in his hands and in his feet, incised wounds, the spear through his side, he suffered that for you, for me. Even without your permission. Now if he could do that for you. Without your request. But he knows that you need it. Have you recognized your need? Are you then willing. To accept. What he has done for you. Bearing all those wounds that you should have borne. Those wounds forever opened up a fountain that continues to flow even today. Flowing in us and through us. We now know, acknowledge, and confess the truth that it was our griefs he bore. It was our sorrows he carried. Yet as we saw him on the cross, some thought he was being punished by God for his own sins. But no, it was for our transgressions and for our iniquities, just in order that we might have peace. In order that we might be healed. In order that we might be saved. The truth is that we were the ones who went astray. Who walked in our self-will. Yet Jehovah placed our iniquities on him. What a thing. We were the ones. The sinless substitute bore our iniquities. Amidst the wreckage of humanity, he ripped open his side and gave his blood so that we who were trapped by slavery to sin could experience freedom, salvation from the penalty and the power of sin. It was all he had left. His friends had gone. His strength was waning. His possessions had been gambled away at his feet. And even his father had turned his head away. His blood was all he had left. But his blood was all it took to pay the ultimate sacrifice. And thou dying lamb, thy precious blood, shall never lose its power. So if you are experiencing a bony, dry, parched, spiritual life, then here's what might have happened according to Jeremiah 2.13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Two things. Forsaken me the real and the true fountain. That guarantees a constant gushing stream. 
of living waters. You have mistakenly or foolishly traded for the unreal and instead have chosen broken, leaky cisterns of stagnant water. If we forsake the real for the fake by following our own inclinations, then we too would have hewn broken cisterns that leak water from every conceivable place. But I have an invitation. And it is the question that faces you and all of us today. Will you stop drinking from broken cisterns? Will you accept the invitation to taste of the rich fountain of God's grace and mercy. God's promise was to Moses, I will stand on the rock. The rock in Horeb of itself could do nothing. But God on the rock. God in the rock. God of the rock. And God the rock can do anything and everything for us. Then that would be all that we need. Ho oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Ye come. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. Come and taste of the bounties of divine grace. The only sacrifice necessary is the sacrifice of self. Why should anyone be hungry and thirsty while there is an abundant supply of food and water free? It costs the father pain and grief, but he is willing to pay the price and absorb the cost for you. So he says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. We need this water, do we? We need the water on the inside to purify our system, and to transport waste matter out of our lives. Many of us going around with unnecessary waste matter in our lives. We need this water inside. Waste matter such as pride, waste matter such as malice, Waste matter such as hate, lying, backbiting, commandment breaking, selfishness. Yes, we need the cool, refreshing waters of the cleansing stream to wash us on the outside to remove dead cells that still cling to us like barnacles. And wash away the residue of dirt and mud from wallowing in sin's muddy, stagnant stream in which the enemy has immersed us. Yes, it is unlikely that there will be any reduction in the wages of sin. Don't wait for a discount. None is promised. But today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts. If you cry out like David, have mercy upon me, O God, and according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Is there anybody here today who would want to cry out like David, Lord, have mercy upon me? If you are here, then I want you to join me by standing. Say, Lord, my soul is getting a little thirsty. And I need your refreshing. 
All of us are not at the same level, you know. Some of us may feel that we are up here. Some may feel we are down here. But wherever you are, God's grace is sufficient. And uh, that fountain is flowing for you today. Yes, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Amen. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. And he also is become my salvation. Today, if you have been visiting this church and you have not made a commitment yet to Christ, but you want to say, Lord, I'm already standing because I feel that thirst. But I want to make a commitment to you that by your grace, I want that fountain of water in my soul. If that's you, not yet committed through the waters of baptism, then raise your hand so I can pray for you. Ask your pastor to pray for you. He's going to do that prayer for us, pastor. Is there any unbaptized, regardless of your age, young or old, this is your opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Tomorrow is not promised to you. There's only one day you have. Each day. And that's today. You want to make that day substantial. Make that day satisfying for you and for Jesus. So when you get over on the other side, that Sam, the, as they say, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Want Jesus to be satisfied with you? Commit yourself to the Lord. If you have not yet done so, just raise your hand and we'll pray for you. We're not going to baptize you today. We have no plans for that, but you need to do that sometime. I don't know who you are, I don't know your situation, but God knows. And if you do not want to raise your hand, prayer is still going to encompass you and so for the rest of us who are standing pastor we ask that you pray that God will fill us till we want no more we need that fountain let us pray Lord we come before you thanking you Lord for this beautiful reminder because we are a generation that is thirsting. We're thirsting for you. And Lord, it doesn't matter how long we've been doing church work, how long we've grown up in this church, without you, we are nothing. And just like the spiritual, or just like Israel of old, there are many times that we have come to different points in our lives where we feel like giving up, where we're asking the questions, where are you? You let us hear, but why is it that I'm going through a barren time? Lord, even as a church, we've questioned and said, where is the Lord on this matter? But we're so grateful for this reminder yes. that you will never leave us nor forsake us. A reminder that all we need to do is uh, obey your word and you will pour out water from a place that we never even expected. And you will be our mighty provider. So, Lord, forgive us of the moments of doubt in our lives. Forgive us of those moments where we tremble that and, 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 and refuse to remember your word, oh God, your promises. Forgive us, Lord, when we were trembling in those moments. And allow us, oh God, to, to have courage 
to hold steadfast to your word and to your promises. We thank you, Lord, for all those who stood, all those online who are watching and also are, 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 are symbolically standing. We thank you, Lord, for those who want to be baptized in the near future, for those who want Bible study, for those who want to, a, a change in their hearts, Lord, because they're acknowledging that they're thirsty for you and they're accepting you as their Lord and Savior. Well, Lord, next week's Sabbath, we want to celebrate those hands. We want to celebrate those individuals. And we pray, God, that you'll make their decision firm in their minds. Yes. I thank you, Lord, for the speaker today. Dr. Wellington has shared from his heart. I thank you, Lord, for his wife. I thank you for his children and grandchildren. I thank you for his friends and family, Lord, that you have blessed him with. And I thank you for the influence of, that he has had on this entire church and the church body throughout Inter-America Division and even here in North America Division. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to bless his household. And as a church family, we, we pray that you'll keep them in perfect peace. Bring healing, bring blessings, bring prosperity upon yes. them. Yes. And direct them always. Lord, we thank you for the food. We've just been blessed with the spiritual. Now we're about to eat the physical. And we thank you for the hands that prepared it. Ultimately, we thank you for providing it. And we love you, Lord, and we long to see you again. So please, Lord, come quickly. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. amen. And amen. amen. You may be seated.